Seamen of the Proserpine, your conduct has been such as to merit the thanks of the court with that of your country, and I trust that the example shown by you for good order and obedience to command in times of great difficulty and danger will be held forth as worthy of imitation by all the seamen of his majesty's fleet. So ended the court-martial for the loss of the Proserpine. The events that led up to the court-martial could certainly be considered worthy of the court's remarks. Hello, and welcome to the Shipwreck Archive. Thank you. Would you happen to have the story, HMS Proserpine, Stuck in the Ice? Here we are. Enjoy! The Proserpine had been built in 1777, and had had a respectable career with the British Navy. She was by no means the largest Navy ship, she only carried 28 guns, but she still had a series of enemy ships that she had captured in her history. Her next task was not combat-related, however. The Proserpine departed from Yarmouth, bound for Cuxhaven, on January 28th, 1799. Her mission was to transport the Honorable Thomas Grenville, Foreign Secretary, who had been tasked with bringing important dispatches from England to the German court in Berlin. He had brought with him his own companions, which sailed in addition to the 200 crew members the HMS Proserpine carried. The HMS Proserpine was intended to be just one leg of his journey. It was later said that Captain Wallace of the Proserpine had been reluctant to set sail, not trusting that they would make the voyage due to the time of year or weather, but that Grenville had insisted, saying that his business was too urgent to wait. HMS Proserpine was not sailing alone. With her came the Prince of Wales, a packet ship. The estuary of the River Elbe was known to be hard to navigate due to a large number of sandbanks that had to be steered around, and in spite of the two pilots that the Proserpine carried as part of her company, it was necessary to pick up a pilot with local knowledge as well. That night, the Proserpine and the Prince of Wales anchored at the buoy that marked the entrance of the river for the night and then began to prepare to continue on their journey the next morning. They were in for a nasty surprise, however. The boys in the river had all been removed. There was a quick meeting held between Captain Wallace, Grenville, and the pilots about what they should do. The two ships decided not to turn around, partially at the reassurance of their pilots. Instead, they decided that they should be able to travel between half-ebb and half-flood tides when the sandbanks were visible. The pilots felt that using this method should get them safely to Cuxhaven. They assured the other people in the meeting that they knew the signs of the sandbars very well. They began their voyage up the river on the 31st of January, and at first, it seemed as though it was going to work. The Prince of Wales sailed in the lead, with the Proserpine following behind. The weather was also in their favor until around 4 p.m., when only four miles away from Cuxhaven, heavy snow blew in, forcing both ships to anchor and hope to ride out the storm. By nine, it was a full blizzard, and the combination of a shift in the wind and the ebbing tide brought a large amount of ice in the water to batter the ship. Through the night, the crew of the Proserpine battled to keep their station in spite of the strong winds and ice, until the next morning when they could assess their situation. The Prince of Wales, which had accompanied them this far, had run aground in the night. The flood tide of the morning had carried almost all of the ice up, which meant that the river ahead was blocked and would be impossible to get through, but they could turn around and go back with some safety. 
it was decided to leave the Elbe entirely, with all of her dangers, and instead try to make a landing on the coast of Jutland. Grenville insisted to Captain Wallace that, if at all possible, he had to get to shore somewhere where he would be able to travel to Berlin, that his mission was an important one. Captain Wallace did his best, but after the pilots had told him that they were safely past the sandbars, the proserpine struck hard on the end of a sandbank jutting out from Newark Island. The force with which she struck was mostly explained by the gale that was still blowing, even though the HMS Proserpine had been sailing with the smallest amount of sail possible. The Proserpine was firmly stuck on the sandbank, with only ten feet of water under her keel, even though it was high tide. The first thought of Captain Wallace was to free her using the anchor, and they lowered a boat with this intention, but the tide was now going out. As the tide went out, the ice returned, and made it too dangerous for anyone to be in the small boat. The plan to free the ship using the anchor was abandoned. The next course of action was to lighten the ship, and the top mast was thrown overboard to shore up the ship so that she would not tip into the water when the tide went out which would put her in an even worse situation than she already was in. As the tide went out, such heavy ice also came with it that it undid all of the work they had done shoring up the ship, cutting their rudder in two, and tore the copper sheeting off of their ship's starboard side. All day, all the heavy stores, as well as the ship's guns, were thrown overboard, and the crew operated with the anticipation that when the tide came in next, they had lightened the ship enough that she should float free. Though the items that they were throwing overboard were by no means light in many cases, the ice was thick enough that the things thrown from the ship did not sink. Around ten that night, the high tide came back in, but they were disappointed. The strength of the storm and the contrary winds meant that the tide came in three feet lower than it had been when they had struck at the last high tide. With this, everyone on the ship gave up the idea that they were going to be able to get the ship off. The people on the ship spent a miserable night. The fresh ebb of the tide came with the very real apprehension of the ship being torn apart by the ice that accompanied it. It was intensely cold and dark. The deck was so slippery with the ice that it was difficult to work on, and the falling snow also coated anyone who ventured onto the deck with ice. The next morning dealt the final blow to the HMS Proserpine. The storm now blew even more strongly, and the ice was up to the cabin windows by this time. The ship's stern post had broken in two, and it was becoming increasingly clear that the ship did not offer much in the way of comfort or shelter any longer. Grenville proposed that the ship should be evacuated by traveling across the ice, which had proven itself thick enough by holding up the ship's stores they had thrown overboard the day before. He pointed out that it was their only means of escape, and their danger was immediate. Captain Wallace was a little more uncertain. He could think of many dangers that could come with leaving the ship as well. The weather was foul, it was extremely cold, and it would be easy for them to get lost. Still, since no other possibilities presented themselves, and the company seemed in general agreement that it would be best course of action, Captain Wallace gave his permission. They commenced abandoning the Proserpine at a quarter past one on an ebb tide, led by the 1st Division and Grenville. These were the men who were to lead the way to safety, and they carried a compass to aid them. Once they could see the beacon in the distance, they changed direction to make for the Newark Lighthouse. Behind them followed the ship's subdivisions, each led on the march by their officers. By 3 p.m., Captain Wallace and the Lieutenant of the Marines were the only people who remained on the ship, and having seen that the evacuation had gone smoothly and orderly, Captain Wallace and the Lieutenant joined in the march. 
depending on the source, they walked between six or eight miles, each one of them miserable. There was still very cold weather, strong winds, and snow. The ice that they were walking on would come and go, and sometimes they were up to their middle in snow and water. The group that had set out first reached Newark around four in the afternoon, but Captain Wallace and the last people to leave the Proserpine did not arrive there until half past six. The next morning they mustered everyone and found that seven sailors and one of the ship's boys were missing, as were four marines, and a woman and child. One of the sailors who was missing was suspected of having returned to the ship with the intention of looting it. This was particularly remarked on when a couple of days later, people in Newark told the company that they had seen the Proserpine swung around from where they had left her, and higher up on the bank, her ensign was flying upside down as a sign of distress, showing that someone had been on board of her since they had officially evacuated. When they had left, the ensign had not been hoisted. If the sailor had returned with the intention of plundering the ship, it does not seem likely he met with much success, since he was never seen again. Neither were the other thirteen people who were found missing at morning muster. It was imagined that they had all succumbed to the cold and the storm. Some of the people who did arrive in Newark had frostbite, but all made a recovery. The night of the 5th of February, the storm finally began to calm, and the survivors of the Proserpine were beginning to run short on supplies. It was therefore decided on the morning of the 6th that Grenville, who was anxious to complete his mission, his party, and half of the crew and officers of the Proserpine should attempt the trip to Cuxhaven. Some of the locals agreed to act as their guides. Even with local guides, the trip was not a pleasant one. It involved crossing the river, on the ice when they could, and through the waist-deep freezing water when ice was not available. The men who made the trip cut away the last few provisions that they had saved from the ship to lessen their load, leaving with only the clothes on their backs, with the exception of Grenville, who held on to his dispatches. After a trip of five hours, they arrived at Cuxhaven, but Grenville only rested for one day before he continued on his journey to Berlin. Captain Wallace had not sent the entire crew on the walk to Cuxhaven, because it was his hope that he would be able to save at least some of the items from the Proserpine before she completely went to pieces. On the 8th, the ship's master volunteered to take a party of men to see what could be done especially to collect some bread since there was now a serious shortage of supplies to feed the group. They returned with some supplies, but also reported that the Proserpine now had seven and a half feet of water in her, and she was beginning to break apart, with only the amount of ice around her keeping her together. It was also found that the sailor who was suspected to have gone back to loot probably had done so since they found chests on the ship broken open. With this news, Captain Wallace gave up the idea of being able to recover any more from the Proserpine. And slowly, groups of sailors made the trip to Cuxhaven with their officers. While Captain Wallace may have given up on getting anything else from the Proserpine, the ship's master had other plans. On the morning of the 10th, without telling Captain Wallace, six of the members of the crew of the ship's master, in the lead, got on board the Proserpine once more. They did not notice the tide coming in until it was too late, and they were forced to remain on the ship overnight. Another violent storm blew in over that night, and the next morning, those on shore were alarmed to find that they were no longer able to see the ship. They presumed that the six men who had been on board of her were lost. This proved not to be the case. The ice had frozen around the Proserpine in a protective shell, keeping her afloat, and they eventually were cast away on the island of Baltram, from where they headed to Cuxhaven. They arrived on the 22nd of February, only a day before Captain Wallace made the trip himself. 
he would write to the Navy that his departure from Newark had been delayed because his health had deteriorated, and some of the men with him also needed time to recover since they had been frostbitten badly. They only made the journey to Cuxhaven when they were forced to by the quickly dwindling supplies. Once they arrived in Cuxhaven, they found that the people of their crew had been broken up across many packet ships, all waiting for the ships to be able to sail once the ice had broken up. On the 6th of March, the first mate of the Proserpine announced the arrival of himself and some crew in Yarmouth, with Captain Wallace expected every day. The former pilot of the Proserpine would swear a statement in the newspapers about the wreck that soon caused the public to take interest. It was his claim that some of the sailors had refused to leave the Proserpine because they had been intoxicated, and that when people had returned the next day, they had all been found frozen. His account offers a questionable timeline where everyone is safe in Newark on the 1st of February and they had already returned to investigate the ship on the 2nd. He then says that the entire ship's company made the trip to Cuxhaven immediately. One of the gentlemen, who seems to have been a part of Greenhaven's party, also made claims that one of the Marines, on arriving at Newark, had passed due to alcohol, rather than any terrible conditions. In the same account, the man boasts of how well Greenhaven's party Grenhaven, and himself bore the miserable conditions, as well as bemoans the loss of their things in the wreck. These accounts were quickly circulated through the papers, but Captain Wallace, as well as his officers, were not willing to allow such an account to circulate uncontested. They demanded that the True Britain, one of the papers that had published this version of events, issue a total retraction, as all of these claims were false and they had nothing but gratitude for the good conduct of the sailors and marines through the trying events. They begged the public to be patient until the results of the court-martial. On the 26th of March, the court-martial declared Captain Wallace and his officers to be entirely blameless in the loss of the proserpine. Perhaps because of the rumors that had circulated after the loss of the ship, the court took special care to call attention to the good conduct exhibited by the crew. Everyone on the Proserpine had lost all of their belongings, from the captain down. When they had been conducting salvage, the emphasis had been on food, since while the people of Newark had been hospitable and generous, they did not have enough food stored for the winter to feed an entire unexpected ship's company. The only person who would see any reimbursement for his lost possessions was Grenville, however. In 1802, he was reimbursed 1,086 pounds for the loss of his things on board the Proserpine. For more information, please see Shipwrecks of the Revolutionary and Napoleonic Eras by Terence Gocott, or see our other sources in the description below. Thank you for listening. Thank you for visiting the Shipwreck Archives. See you soon.